Welcome everyone and thank you for joining the weekly Mind and Bleed series on um, how to prepare how to be an F1. Um, thank you very much and if you have any questions please post them under the comments section. Um, if you forget to answer or if something comes up to your mind later on just please send us a message and we're happy to answer all the questions. Um, the session is going to be recorded um, and we will send you the link after the session and all the materials are going to be available to you if you register at our website mindofleep.com slash webinar hyphen registration. I'm going to post this under the comment section as well. Before the start, um, I'd like to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, the MDU. Uh, please don't forget to sort out your MDU foundation membership before you start shadowing because unless you fill a foundation application form, your student membership will cease in the summer. It's essential that you do have indemnity cover, so check out the sign-up links, which I'm also going to post under the comment section uh, very shortly. Um, now I'm going to hand over to Dr. Annabel Brown, who's going to give us a session on reviewing and requesting bloods. I hope you all enjoy it and if you, if you have any questions just please post them in the in the chat box on Facebook. Thank you Sarah. So hello everyone thanks so much for joining us today. Today we'll be talking about blood tests in the hospital setting. So it's a common anxiety among new doctors and a source of much uncertainty. This talk is aimed at uh, primarily F1 doctors or F1 doctors to be, but also it will be relevant to first responders, nurses, and other healthcare professionals and other members of the MDT as well. Um, exactly as Sarah said, there'll be questions um, at the end. And if anything needs clarifying, let us know. Um, Sarah will have an eye on the chat and we will answer all that we can at the end. So this session will be recorded exactly as Sarah said, and we'll send you the link and materials afterwards if you're all registered. So let's get started. Uh, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Annabelle. I'm one of the F1s um, in a Northwest London hospital. Um, and today I'll be giving this presentation. So as a junior doctor, I do requesting bloods and interpreting them day in, day out. And to those um, F1s to be, you will also be doing the same. So I thought that would be a good place for us to start. So today we'll be covering to bleed or not to bleed or when to request bloods and when not to request bloods, interpreting the results and urgent conditions, and finally, common order sets for various scenarios and a couple of cases at the end as well. So why is it important? Well, blood tests are a crucial part of hospital life as they provide a window into how the body is working and whether the treatments that we're providing are making a difference. There's a large variety of tests that you can request from your hospital lab. And with the multidisciplinary teams such as phlebotomists, nurses, doctors, dietitians, Together, you can get some answers uh, by bleeding the patients to get um, to better improve their care. However, it comes with a caveat that no blood test should be considered completely in isolation. It must be considered within the whole clinical picture in order to be used effectively. So the we do know, so we know that they're common and we know that you deal with them day in and day out, and we know that life-threatening imbalances can be detected on bloods often before clinical symptoms manifest, including some of the electrolytes that we'll be talking through later. And it requires practice, as with any new system, it takes time to get used to. So when should you order blood tests? Well, indications for blood tests can vary and they include pathologies from every system in the body. For example, if someone has an acute kidney injury or AKI, monitoring their urea, creatinine and electrolytes can give a crucial update as to whether the kidney injury is getting better or worse and as to whether the treatment you're giving them is working. On the other hand, a look at white blood cells and CRP, which is a marker of inflammation, can tell you if an infection is improving or worsening and can guide your antibiotic choice and further management. So, when should we not be ordering blood tests? Well, this is just as important. Daily bloods are not needed for these groups. For those patients that are stable and medically fit for discharge, once a week will often suffice. 
And for most patients, weekend bloods are not needed unless they're essential. Now, this will be very different depending on the department that you're working in and also depending on the type of patients that you're treating. So some people, some patients will need weekend bloods and others won't. And it's always good to ask if you're unsure. And there's two reasons why it's just as important to know not to order blood tests as it is to know when to order them. So at best, they're a nuisance for patients and painful at worst. So you've really got to ask yourself, is your blood test going to affect your management plan? Secondly, the cost of blood tests vary hugely from a few pence to up to 10 pounds, which for our international listeners is about 14 US dollars. And all of these cost the NHS, which is nothing to worry about if the team need them to guide clinical management. But if you don't actually need them, then it's a needless cost. So what are routine bloods? When people say routine bloods, they tend to mean these four. Full blood count, use and ease or urea and electrolytes, CRP or C-reactive protein and LFTs. Often LFTs, the liver function tests, are not required with the routine bloods, but this is very job specific, such as if you're in a gastroenterology or upper GI surgery firm, you might need these with the routine bloods, but otherwise they're often not needed. This is an easy one to check if you're unsure. So how do we interpret our routine bloods? We're gonna look at each component of the routine bloods in turn starting with the full blood count. Now there's lots of info to be gained from a full blood count and it includes hemoglobin, white cell count, including a breakdown of the different white cells and how high the levels are or low the levels are in your patient and more useful bits like platelets and mean corpuscular volume and all sorts of useful things. So starting with the hemoglobin, if you notice a hemoglobin drop of more than five grams per liter, this tends to be concerning. The reason we'd say roughly five is because sometimes when people get a lot of fluids, it can dilute their blood and you can get an HB drop without actual bleeding. It's just that the blood test is affected because you've added fluids. However, more than five, it usually warrants looking into. So does your patient have bleeding anywhere, such as hematuria or blood in the urine, dark black sticky stool or melina, bloody diarrhea or menstrual bleeding? Otherwise, it's helpful to look into other blood tests such as hematinics and B12 and folate to see if there's a reversible cause of their anemia. Moving on to neutrophils, it can guide you as to how an infect, whether there's an infection and even the type of infection. So we know that neutrophils are the primary white blood cells that respond to bacterial infection. Neutrophils can react within an hour of tissue injury and are a hallmark of an acute inflammation. The most common cause of a marked neutrophilia or high neutrophils is a bacterial infection, but they can also rise after myocardial infarction or other stresses, even smoking. Neutrophils below normal range, on the other hand, or neutropenia, is potentially associated with life-threatening infection. It's most significant when the total neutrophil count is less than 0.5 per 10 to the nine, particularly when the neutropenia is due to impaired production, such as if a patient has had chemotherapy. In routine clinical practice, the most frequent cause of a low neutrophil count is an, is an obvious or hidden viral infection, including viral hepatitis. So, that takes us on to another key character in the routine bloods, the CRP or C-reactive protein. So as you can see here, CRP is an inflammatory protein produced by the liver. It rises in inflammatory states, such as in infection, but it can lag behind the white cell count. A detailed history and exam can be incredibly helpful and looking for infective systems, uh, symptoms can be um, the reason for a risen CRP. So headaches, cough, vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, abdominal pain, fevers, etc. All manner of symptoms and it can be really helpful as to why the CRP is rising in your patient. Investigations that can be helpful include a full septic screen. So for those that are familiar with the septic six, um, it's a give three and take three approach. 
and it includes taking blood cultures, giving fluids, getting a lactate and giving antibiotics as well. Other parts of the septic screen, apart from the septic six, are a chest x-ray and a urine dip or culture to basically find the source of why they have an infection. So assessing a patient that has a raised CRP and a white cell count, you wanna be going top to toe and looking for any source of infection. So as you can see here on the top left, we've got this swollen hand associated with a phlebitis after a cannula insertion point has become infective. Any break to skin can be a source of infection, and you're basically looking for anywhere where the skin's natural barrier has broken down. Moving to the top right image, um, there's a catheter in place here, and you, note, you can note the appearance of the urine. It's quite cloudy, which can suggest a urine infection, so you definitely want a urine dip and a urine culture for this patient as well. Um, moving on to the next patient on the bottom right, uh, we can see this patient's got a red swollen leg, suggestive of cellulitis, which is an infection of the soft tissue. And the fourth picture there um, is to represent pain. So I found that when you're on call and you're a bit tired, a structure such as top to toe can help you cover all the important questions of a new fever or a risen CRP or a risen white cell count without missing anything. So you start at the top and ask about headaches, sore throat and work your way down the entire body. So this can help you find the source of an infection and help you best treat the patient. So that was full blood count and CRP. Moving on to urea and electrolytes. These are a really crucial part of routine bloods. And today we're gonna to be looking at the um, hypo and hypernatremia, hypo and hyperkalemia, and urea and creatinine ratio. Now with hyper and hyponatremia, you really need to know the fluid status of your patient in order to treat this. For a deep dive into hypo and hypernatremia, we've got a really excellent webinar from a couple of weeks ago that I recommend you have a look at because it's, it can be quite a tricky topic, but with someone walking you through the examples and how best to assess someone with a high or low sodium, um, it can really help you, especially for if you're net, when you're next on call. Um, similarly, with hyper and hypokalemia, these are usually concerning because we know that these abnormalities can lead to life-threatening heart arrhythmias. Again, we've got a dedicated webinar for this from a few weeks ago for a deep dive. So we're just touching on this today. Finally, in the, foot, in the urea and electrolytes, the urea and creatinine ratio is hugely helpful to diagnose and monitor acute kidney injury. It can also help you to see whether your treatment is working and to monitor an AKI. The other important thing to note about urea and creatinine is not only the ratio, but if someone has chronic kidney disease or long-term kidney disease in different stages, knowing their baseline creatinine from say GP records or their last time in hospital can be really helpful for you to understand whether they're getting back to their baseline from their AKI. So moving on to the final of the routines, we've got liver function tests including ALP, which stands for alkaline phosphatase, and ALT, standing for alanine transaminase. So ALP, ALT, and another one, gamma GT, are used to distinguish between hepatocellular damage and cholestasis. Bilirubin, albumin, and prothrombin are used to assess the liver's synthetic function or how well it can make those substances. We know that ALP, the alkaline phosphatase, is particularly concentrated in the liver, bile duct, and bone tissues. An ALP is often raised in liver pathology due to increased synthesis in response to cholestasis. Co cholestasis excuse me. As a result, ALP is a really useful indirect marker of cholestasis. ALT, on the other hand, the alanine transaminase, is found in high concentrations within hepatocytes, the cells of the liver, and it enters the blood following hepatocellular injury or injury within the liver itself, rather than within the, gall, the um, gallbladder system. Therefore, the ALT is a really useful marker of hepatocellular injury, and you can use the ratio of a risen ALP and ALT to determine between a hepatitic picture or a cholestatic picture. 
Bilirubin, on the other hand, is a breakdown product of haemoglobin. And asking about a patient's symptoms like the colour of the urine and colour of stools can give an indication as to the cause of jaundice, whether the problem is prehepatic, intrahepatic or post-hepatic. Small fluctuations are to be expected in LFTs, especially as ALP in particular can rise in acute infection. However, large fluctuations need investigating. And that's a really good one to discuss with your team, especially if you're on a gastro firm where you're likely to see deranged LFTs a lot. So we've been through when to order bloods, when not to order bloods, and the routine bloods and a quick overview of how to interpret them. For our final segment today, the for our final third, we're gonna be looking at common order sets for clinical presentations. So these tend to be routine bloods plus. And the reason why I've included this in the talk is for those of you who are soon to be F1s, um, when you are on take or seeing new patients coming in for the first time, it's quite useful to have an idea of the investigations that you'd want to know. So when you're the one in charge of ordering the bloods for your patient, it's useful to have a bit of a cheat sheet to know what would be a helpful blood test for this particular presenting complaint. But like we said at the beginning, all blood tests need to be taken into account with the full clinical picture and no blood test in isolation. So with that, let's go on to common order sets for clinical presentations or routine bloods plus. So the first one that we're talking about today is tachycardia. And these are some common order sets that you could reasonably order with, um, with routine bloods when assessing someone who's coming with tachycardia. The main three that you need are a thyroid profile, magnesium and a bone profile. So the thyroid profile will include the TSH or the thyroid stimulating hormone and the free T4, which is the thyroxine hormone that's um, circulating in response to the TSH. And the reason why you would want these three is because you're looking for any other causes of tachycardia that could be contributing to their presenting complaint. We also know that bone profile, it will come up um, quite a lot in these, uh, both in clinical practice, but also in these order sets, um, because it can be really helpful to understand what's going on with someone's with a patient's phosphate and with the rest of their bone profile as well. So moving on to our next order set. For someone with chronic anemia, we touched upon this a bit before, anemia being a low HB or hemoglobin, the extras that you could want are include a blood film, B12 and folate and iron studies, also known as hematinics, um, the, the above, to identify a cause for the anemia. We know that B12 and folate can cause anemia, so investigating these is important with any patient to see if there's an easily reversible cause, such as replacing their B12 and folate. So as we are coming to the second half of our common order sets, I thought we'd discuss a case. So you are on the take, which is seeing new patients in the front door, and there's a 78 year old gentleman who's been admitted from a nursing home, confused with low urine output the last three days. His past medical history is that he usually mobilizes with a stick in his nursing home. He has high blood pressure or hypertension. He has high cholesterol or hypercholesterolemia. He has atrial fibrillation and he also has chronic kidney disease stage one. So we're skipping ahead a little bit by saying you've examined him. Um, your nursing colleague is kindly taking an observation for you. And we, you're now thinking about what investigations you want to order. So just have a think to yourself what blood tests you'll be putting in the request box. You may be thinking full blood count to check for anemia and signs of infection. Use an ease to establish whether there's a cause for whether there's an AKI or an electrolyte imbalance and see how his CKD is doing. CRP as a marker of inflammation for this potential urinary tract infection. And finally, we have this, he's confused and more confused than normal according to the nursing home. 
And we know that at the moment he doesn't have any um, cognitive disorder such as Alzheimer's. So this is a new confusion for him. And for those of you already familiar, we would say that this gentleman most likely is, has delirium, which is an acute confusional state, usually due to an underlying insult. In this case, likely um, a urine tract infection. So what we might want for him as well is a confusion screen. So common order sets for delirium, uh, another common order set would be one for delirium. For that, it's a lot of the same characters. We want a bone profile, we want thyroid function tests, and we want hematinics. All of these are potentially reversible causes. They can show you a, a potentially reversible cause of delirium and an easy fix if need be. So our final case before we close, 26 year old female comes in with abdominal pain for the last 24 hours and a bit more history this time. So pain started in the epigastrium, now more in the right iliac fossa. The pain severity is seven out of 10. No diarrhea, no constipation, no PR bleeding. On examination, tender in the right iliac fossa. So some people may be thinking about some differential diagnoses already. Past medical history, our previous knee surgery in 2005 and last menstrual period was three weeks ago. So you've examined, observations are being taken, which investigations do you want to order? So I'd imagine some of you will be thinking routine bloods plus abdominal pain bloods. Now, a really important one to not forget, especially in a female patient who has come in with abdominal pain will be a beta HCG, also known as a pregnancy test. The reason that we ask for this when uh, women present is because when women present with abdominal pain is not only for a possibly an unknown pregnancy, but also for ectopic pregnancies, which we know is a very serious cause of abdominal pain um, that requires urgent treatment, but if missed is very bad. So other things we want for abdominal pain is a bone profile and a VBG is really helpful, also known as a venous blood gas. So for those unfamiliar, that's when a blood, you take a blood sample and you run it in a gas um, analyzer and it tells you a number of different parameters about a patient when they come in, including if someone has a respiratory presentation, it can tell you whether they have a type one respiratory failure, a type two respiratory failure, and it can also give you a snapshot of their electrolytes as well. For our purposes, for this 24 year old patient, we want it for the lactate and the glucose. So that can tell us a lot about whether perhaps she's septic, has a high or low blood sugar, and it's a really good um, first test when people come in the door because you get the result much quicker than sending off bloods, which can take a couple of hours. Um, whereas the blood gas analyzer, you can take in as much time as it takes you to go and find the machine and put it in and you get a printout there and then. Now, lipase, amylase and LDH. This is particularly useful in abdominal pain if pancreatitis is suspected. So not particularly high on our differentials for the, for the patient we've just had, but important to throw in there because we know that either lipase or amylase, depending on which hospital, uh, which one your hospital uses, um, can be really helpful on first presentation of pancreatitis because it can allow you to establish the severity. So we've been through when to order bloods, when not to order bloods, the routine blood tests and how to interpret them and some common order sets um, and what you might want additionally when you see a patient on the tape or on call. So in summary, bloods are an incredibly useful tool when used correctly. Secondly, always interpret bloods in the context of your patient. Thirdly, ask if unsure because patient safety is your priority. So that's all from me. Let me know if you have any questions and we've got Sarah here as well to help with that. Um, and I'll see what we've got. Otherwise, I think, um, I think that's all from us. And thank you so, so much for listening.
Thank you very much, Annabelle. Um, and thank you everyone for attending our webinar on requesting blood. Uh, please make sure you complete the feedback form, which we're going to post very shortly. Um, and that'll be very useful for Annabelle uh, and that will also help us to improve the sessions in the future. Um, and should we, should we answer some questions? Um, we had a question uh, on what the hematinics include which I think I have partially answered, but we can just reiterate that. So um, that everyone's aware, would you like to give us uh, an explanation, Annabelle? Yeah, of course. So hematinics can vary slightly in whatever hospital you're in, but usually they're ordered after you are looking, after you know that someone is anemic. So we know that the main hematinics are iron, B12 and folate, but depending on your hospital and depending on your lab, you get a full iron profile. So that will include things like transferrin saturation, um, the amount of iron and also the total iron binding capacity as well. So usually for any patient that's anemic or has a low HB, you'll want hematinics. You'll also want them for if someone has had a fall, if someone has delirium, or if someone has uh, an underlying blood disorder that's brought them into hospital. Wait, any, anything to add, Sarah? I, um, I think that is, that is a very good answer. Thank you very much. And just looking for the comments. Mm. Um, there are no other comments regarding the session content, unless you guys would like to Oh, there is a question. Um, I think somebody's asking about a test they used to um, rule out infection, but I'm not really sure. Would it be possible to repeat the, the question? I just liked it. Um, somebody is asking um, whether you could say a bit more about the bone profile, um, as it seems it's needed for a lot of presentations, and why are we not including it as a part of routine investigation? Well, it's a really good, yeah, that's a really good point, a really good question. So it is a particularly useful test. It tells you about someone's phosphate, which, as you know, can be high, low or normal, and um, it can be replaced if it's low and um, managed with fluids if it's high, depending on the cause. And it is, it's a really good question because it is a very useful test especially when people come in with abdominal pain or a fall or in an elderly patient as well. And as far as I know, doing the research for this presentation, it's also quite a cheap test. Um, and so I think that would be a really interesting um, project to look into as to why it isn't requested more. I think that perhaps it's partly dogma, perhaps it's partly tradition that the common order sets are that the routine bloods are FBC, U and E, CRP um, and LFT. But for instance, there will be a lot of patients that would benefit from a bone profile from the get go. But I think it would be an interesting one to look at because for, for every medic that I've met that orders it, there's others that don't find it as helpful um, only because I think maybe if you're not thinking um, so if, if any members of the MDT, like nutritionists or anything like that, um, if we have anyone listening, would also like to chime in. Um, I think it is really helpful, but I think it's often forgotten. Yeah, I, um, I think I'm on, I'm on the same page. I, mm. um, I'd be interested to see um, yeah, if, if there are any audits available to, uh, if we could do something to see whether it should be used more often. Um, Mm. It'll be very interesting. Mm. Um, somebody has commented and said that it's usually requested for the patients um, who are in TPN and PN. And yeah, that is correct. We, when we're giving patients um, TPN or PN, which is um, feeding via the vein, essentially, um, it can cause deranged electrolytes and there is a risk of refeeding syndrome. So this is something that's an absolute must in patients um, who are in TPN or PN. Um, somebody has asked a question on, um, I think they said they've mentioned blood sets for tachycardia. Are there any specific bloods for um, bradycardia? 
Oh, yeah, I think good question. Um, so I think you would also want to know about thyroid profile, because we know that if you have a low thyroid or your hypothyroid, that can cause you to have a low uh, heart rate. Um, I think a magnesium would be helpful, but I'm no expert on um, the ins and outs of cardiology. But I think a magnesium would be helpful quite often because in that patient's management, you would want to know whether you could correct their magnesium and whether it would help. Um, and I also think what else would be helpful in a bradycardia? We know the, the, a good go-to would be to think, what are some differentials as to why they have bradycardia? And then think, is there a blood test that could help us work that out? Um, and at the moment, the main two that come to mind are a thyroid and a magnesium. Um, unless any, any more to add? Um, I'd say that with any rhythm disturbances, it's, um, yeah, I'd say that any electrolytes are doing the renal mm. profile and a bone profile, profile be useful. But mm. again, I'd say that it probably requires a specialist knowledge to, to be sure. But this is something that comes to my mind. But yeah, really great question. Either are there any other questions before we before we finish? Okay, thank you very much guys for all the questions. I think we're going to post the link to the feedback form now. Um, so Annabelle might have a QR code that she can share with you. Yes, and I'm going I to do. post the Yeah, sorry about that. So this so, is the last slide. So please do give us feedback. Um, we really want to improve and these presentations are for you guys. So if you can give us any detailed feedback, that would be really helpful. Um, and it's also helpful for our portfolios as well. Um, by filling in the feedback form, you also get a certificate of attendance. Um, and the, there's some more details about that in the link below, um, which can also be helpful for your portfolios as well. Um, and I have posted the link to the feedback in the comments. Um, and yes, all the sessions are recorded. All you have to do is sign up using the link, which I will repost again. Um, this is the registration link for the webinars. So if you follow this link that I have just posted, then you'll have access to all the recordings um, and all the future webinars. Um, if you have any questions that um, come up after we finish the session, or if anything comes to your mind at any point, just please um, message us on Facebook and we'll be happy to reply. And as Annabelle, Annabelle has said, uh, we're very keen to improve the sessions. Uh, so we'd appreciate the feedback. And uh, please make sure you do sign up to Mind the Bleep. And uh, we're also running um, the Finance Medic series on Tuesdays. So again, if you follow the sign up link, you can sign up to that. And um, that's it for today. And please join us next week. Uh, we're going to do the session on 12th and it's going to be on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Thanks Thank so much, guys. Thank you. Take care. Bye.